This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African Drums are sounding. Welcome to this edition of African Drums. Um, last week we talked about the African Village Movement. In fact, last week and the week before that, parts one and part two of the African Village Movement and Socioeconomic Development of Guyana. This week we're focusing on cooperativism in Guyana. Uh, interestingly, in a sense, there is a connection between the conversation we've been having for the past two weeks and this one that we're going to be having today. As you know as well, recently, the Commissioner of Cooperatives in Guyana has announced that over 200 cooperatives have been identified for uh, for closure. Um, that is a significant development. Mm -hmm. So tonight on the program, we're going to focus on cooperativism, both the cooperative movement and the larger concept of cooperativism. Tonight in studio, I'm joined by, to my far uh, far left, Mr. Desmond Trotman, a member of parliament mm -hmm. for the uh, alliance, for the a partnership for national unity, APNU, and um, Mr. Vincent Alexander, social activist, um, Miss Maria Bailey, also social activist, entrepreneur, and uh, actually the chairperson of one of the cooperative unions that was identified for um, for for closure. I want to welcome all of you to the program this evening. Um, and uh, just thank you for, for responding to the call. Um, I wanted to start off the conversation and I'll direct the question to, to Ms. Alexander. Uh, considering the significance of the African village movement here in Guyana and the global evolution of cooperativism, what would you say is the importance of cooperatives and cooperativism in Guyana? First of all, thank you very much for having me on the program. I would like to start off by addressing the question of cooperativism. And why I would wish to do that, because I consider cooperatives and the cooperative movement to be the kind of institutional aspect, or one of the institutional aspects for the realization of cooperativism. Cooperativism is the broader concept, and it really speaks to the question of how in a situation of individuals, individual diversity, or in a situation of ethnic diversity, one creates a collective movement for the purpose of nation building. And that is the idea, I think, really behind cooperativism. How do you create a situation where the ethnic groups cooperate and that's at the, the, the macro level, the aggregate level. How do you create a situation where individuals cooperate? How do you create a situation where institutions cooperate? So for example, on the cooperativism, you can talk about a cooperative, where people among themselves cooperate for a particular objective. On the cooperativism, you could talk about the sector is cooperating. So you can talk about cooperation between the public sector, and the private sector, and the cooperative sector. On the cooperativism, you can talk about the different groups, be they social groups or ethnic groups uh, cooperating. I think that was the idea behind cooperativism. Given the nature of the Guyanese society, how do you find a philosophy that can drive the interaction of the people in a way that they are united mm -hmm. without diminishing their individual groups or individual identities in the pursuit of national unity and national development. And one other aspect which became important in that regard, particularly from the ethnic perspective, was that one could associate with each of the ethnic groups, the spirit 
of cooperativism within the group itself. So whether you talk about the African Guyanese and their, the village movement, where they literally form cooperatives as a form of management of the, the villages, whether you talk about the indo Guyanese and the way in which in the extra-nuclear areas they cooperated in terms of their farm activities, you talk about the Amerindian Guyanese and their the, the own communal form of existence. You could appeal to them through the philosophy of cooperativism because they could identify with it on the basis of what they themselves were doing in their own communities. So if one talks about the American dream, then the parallel in the Guyana, cooperativism was the Guyana dream. How do you get an idea that could motivate and stimulate the involvement of the people in the process? And having gotten the idea, what institutions do you need to put in place to ensure that that process, in fact, took root? And so also in terms of cooperativism, you had to talk about national institutions to foster the kind of cooperative, mm -hmm. cooperativism that was being talked about. Mm. Now, cooperativism, or I should say at least cooperatives, the institutional framework people pull their resources together to achieve some, some objective, is not new, it's not, and it's not unique to Guyana. This is a global thing. Um, how has cooperatives worked in other parts of the world, Mr. Trackman? Well, um, my 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 um, knowledge of cooper cooperatives um, have been focused primarily on how it is they operate in Guyana. But I sense that um, there have been there's some similarities to um, in other countries because um, I guess that the excellent the very excellent um, description which uh, Mr. Alexander uh, spoke about can be applied to every, um, to every situation where cooperatives and cooperatism um, are being focused on. So that um, I cannot um, give you concrete examples of how it is that they have operated in other um, societies, but I sense that um, for to, to be successful, they have had to, be, they have had to um, inculcate the attitudes which uh, Ms. Alexander referred to in order to make them work and successful. Do you want to add? Mr. Yes, I would say this, that um, on the question of the cooperative movement, it is a worldwide movement. Mm -hmm. Some people seem not to know, but it is a worldwide movement. Um, in terms of advocacy, one could relate the cooperative movement to the Rosdale brothers, I think. Yes, the Rosdale pioneers. The Rosdale pioneers, yes. which, were, which were, who were British. Yes. Right, so the actual thing called the cooperative mm -hmm. could be associated with the Rochdale pioneers who were, who were British. And if you look across the globe, you would see that in the developed countries, be it America, be it Canada, they have a significant cooperative sector. sector. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know sometimes that we go to buy name brand goods. Like Ocean Spray, I understand. That yes. are owned, yeah. that are the, the, the consequence of cooperative ventures. Um, lots of the wines we buy, uh, they are family cooperatives. So there's a significant uh, involvement in, cooperative, in the cooperative movement across the globe and particularly in the developed countries. So yes, cooperatives is not something peculiar to Guyana. It has its birth outside of Guyana. But I would say cooperativism, which sought to make the way in which you bring together all of the forces in Guyana to work together, has some uniqueness in relation to Guyana. The institution called the cooperative is not unique to Guyana, but cooperativism as a national philosophy uh, is unique. It parallels, for example, the idea of self-management in Yugoslavia. So what you found is, after the period of decolonization, uh, the colonies were looking for philosophies and ideas uh, that could give identity to the colonies in terms of their own efforts 
to, to foster development. And Guyana found that cooperativism could work for us because of the historical nature of cooperatives in Guyana and because of the nature of the society where for it to be successful, we had to bring together people to work cooperatively. Mm. You want to add anything? Well, what I would like to say is that um, Mr. Alexander is giving a broad definition of exactly what it is. And um, I would like to make an example. Now, we know about the Co-op Bank. And due to the wide thing of this Co-op, the Co-op Bank was formed out of one of our ministers going to the Caribbean and see what co-ops was doing in countries like Barbados and these countries and came back to Guyana. At that time, the co-op movement was, the, the entire structure was in place, where you had the regional union, the, 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 the national union, and they were able to bring together the co-op societies. And that is the birth of the co-op bank. So what Mr. Alexander was saying, it's a fact because all the co-op societies, be it what ethnicity it was, it all get involved to form the co-op bank. So that is where Guyana, as Mr. Alexander, give a clear definition. I don't think what we could do now is to build on what Mr. Alexander said and just, you know, to outline. Because there are lots of people there who heard the word co-ops, but they don't know how much it can be a part, impact on their lives. In 1970, Guyana was declared a, a cooperative republic. Exactly. Um, why do you think it was important to do so? I'll start with you, Maria. Well, let me tell you why it was important to do that. Even when, during the time of slavery, the slave masters from England were encouraging the governors to form co-op societies, form societies where you had, they bought out lands and they were able to, you know, formed them into villages. Most of those villages came out of co-ops. And with that, um, co-op become a sector in this country. So Guyana become a tri-sectoral economy, where you have the government, the co-op sector, and the private sector. Mm -hmm. So I think at that time, Mr. Borum said, look, if co-op is going to become a part of a tri-sectoral, we, we must name our country a cooperative republic. And Mr. Alexander gave a very good definition for that purpose. And I think, you know, that may could have been one of his ideas. Mr. Alexander, I think, can elaborate a little more because he was involved in it at a certain level than I would have been involved in it. Um, do you want to elaborate? Well, um, what is significant about 1970 is that Guyana became, in the first instance, a republic. We need to recognize that when we gained independence, we retained the Queen as head of state. Mm -hmm. And so for all intents and purposes, our political independence was incomplete. Mm -hmm. 1970 was an attempt to bring us to the point of completing our political independence and removing the Queen from being head of state and becoming a republic. A republic mm -hmm. which symbolizes that sovereignty resides mm -hmm. in the people. Prior to that, once the Queen is head of state, you have a concept of sovereignty residing <laughs> in, in the Queen. Now, if you have gotten to the point of political independence, you have to have some philosophy that drives your country. And I think here is where cooperativism came in. We had to find a philosophy that was acceptable. Remember in those days, under the leadership of Borna, we said we, we will not be following the East nor the West we will look to find something that is unique mm -hmm. to Guyana and to forge along our own path. Mm -hmm. And cooperativism became the philosophy that was then associated with republicanism. Mm -hmm. That is the people exercising their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so we sought to put in place not only the ideology of cooperativism, mm -hmm. but to put in place institutional arrangements for cooperativism to, for, so as to manifest people exercising their sovereignty through some institutional uh, mechanism. It's not just a question of the parliament exercising sovereignty. It's how you could allow the people through the mechanism of the cooperative. And so we, beyond 1970, I think we got to 1980, we talked about a six-tier 
local democratic system with the People's Cooperative Unit being the base unit of that six-tier system. And those of us who are on the older side of life would recall that even in Georgetown, there, was, there were clear signs of the various cooperative units. So Georgetown itself, like the rest of the country, was divided into people's cooperative units. The idea is that you would encourage people within those geographical areas to be involved in collective activity as a people's cooperative unit. And the collective activity would be both political, social, and even economical. And from that base then, you build the other levels of the state. So in some regards, the cooperative movement also was intended to foster a bottom-up development of the country rather than a top-down development mm -hmm. of the country. If people can do their thing at the level of the cooperative unit, then they do as much as they can do there. What they can do there is then would have been done at the neighborhood level. Mm -hmm. What they couldn't do there would be done at the community level. What they couldn't do there would be done at the district level. What they couldn't do there would be done at the sub-regional level. What couldn't be done there would be done at the regional level. And then the nation at the national level, they would be involved in the subsidiary functions that could not take place lower down. So the emphasis really wasn't going to be the central government. The emphasis was going to be the people's involvement at these various levels of local democracy. And only when they had exhausted their possibilities then the national mechanism would have taken over. So things like foreign affairs, things like defense, things like your monetary system, those are the things the national level would have focused on. In, in addition to giving general policy direction so that there could be cohesion in terms of what the country was doing and where the country was going. So cooperativism was really the philosophy and institutional framework for fostering republicanism, which means, for all intents and purposes, the exercise of sovereignty by the people. Mm -hmm. wow. Now, uh, Mr. Trotman, mm -hmm. uh, cooperatives, based on the definition that we've gotten so far, um, have been very critical, it seems, to our national developmental effort. It's just, it appears as if cooperatives are central to economic development, national development. Um, what would you say has been the role and success of cooperatives in pursuing that, that larger vision that Mr. Um, Alexander outlined? Well, I, um, that's a little difficult um, for me to answer difficult question for me to answer because I, in my own estimation, haven't seen the cooperative movement to be as successful as it was intended. Mr. Um, Alexander just now explained what was the thinking in terms of the whole creation of the cooperative concept in there. And um, a lot of resources went into making that thing a success. But for reasons which I um, don't have all of, don't have, something happened that allowed it to not to materialize as that successful entity that it was intended to be. Do you want to venture a few, a few, what, of, of, of the reasons? No, I, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I, I, I would go there. I would, I would, I would I, take I, a little I, shy at certain I, I, I would go there. Uh, let me go and then yes, my sister. Yes, it's okay. okay. It's okay. All right. I think the, the cooperative movement, I think that's what is correct. Mm -hmm. Didn't have the success that, that was intended. Exactly. Yeah. And there are a number of reasons for it. Mm -hmm. Now, all along I've been saying that the cooperativism was about working together. And that it was an ideology, a philosophy for the nation. Now, unfortunately, the entire nation did not buy into the philosophy insofar as you had one major political party which did not buy into it. The PPP at that time were Marxists, 
they did not believe in cooperatives playing the fundamental role. They believed the state should play the fundamental role. They were the advocates of nationalization and the state controlling the command, commanding heights, the, the heights of the country. The system that they embraced was one similar to what would have been found in Eastern Europe. So that we didn't have the level of cooperation <laughs> among the political parties yes. that was necessary for cooperativism yes. to work. So cooperativism was not embraced by all. Exactly. And so in some regards, mm -hmm. um, we didn't have the political foundation in terms of the nation buying into the idea that was necessary. Secondly, um, I would dare say that there were individuals who were involved in the co-op movement who didn't necessarily embrace the, the equalizing nature of cooperativism mm -hmm. and cooperatives mm -hmm. and true. sought to use those cooperatives uh, to their own ends so that mm -hmm. some of the very actors mm -hmm. were themselves uh, enemies in some regards in terms of what was intended uh, for the cooperative movement so that um, the cooperativism did not succeed the way it should because we didn't have the level of political support required. And at the level of the institution, we didn't have the, level mm -hmm. this, the, the, the required level of commitment mm -hmm. among some of the actors. Mm -hmm. But Maria Cooperatives, still, they, they still did survive. Yeah, they did. And um, mm -hmm. you have some very practical examples. And I, and so, so even in the context, why do you think cooperatives survived? It did survive because there were persons who were in the movement that was willing to see the movement go. But remember that, as Mr. Alexander rightfully outlined, that once you does not have a certain percentage of support of anything, it cannot in no way. But people still struggle. You see, the movement of itself is a membership movement. For a person to be involved in co op societies, be it what, house, land, agriculture, it, you have to be a member. The committee is a volunteer service to this co op society. They're not being paid, right? That is some of the things. And the problem is that the whole structure of the movement has fallen apart. And once the structure of any organization falls apart, there is a, a possibility that the entire organization can collapse. Look, there are housing co-op societies that have existed in this country. I won't run away the fact that I had lots of problems. I'm a member of a housing co-op society. We have tried. We have did infrastructure. We did our own electrification. We have developed our scheme. We did well. We try to work together. It's not an easy task. You have a committee of management. People work for a while and people just move off because people can't afford to give voluntary service. It's a commitment. It's not easy. So, you know, some those are some of the, the things that plague the movements. But Vincent so yeah. raised a very important point. Yeah. Exactly. The, point, the point that he made, mm. in which he said that there were persons who were involved in the leadership of the societies mm -hmm. who saw the societies as their personal team. Exactly. And um, I think if we're speaking frankly, if yeah. we're attempting to find out what happened, That's true. some of them didn't re read the resources of the society exactly. for themselves. I agree. And um, in that kind of situation, it's hardly likely because it would have met the, the, the people, um, while it is true that they place faith in certain um, members as leaders, when they came to the realization that they were being ripped off, they developed a kind of negative concept mm -hmm. of this thing that they were part of. Yes. And um, as a result of that, a lot of the societies fell into um, disrepair. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do know, I believe, that when um, it was decided that we were, we were setting out on the cooperative path, as I said, a lot of resources went into making this thing a reality. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I believe, one of the failings, I believe, um, really had to do with the fact that um, perhaps Mr. Barnum wasn't well served. I, I don't know if, a, if, if um, Vincent will agree with this, but perhaps he wasn't well served um, in the in his choice of personnel to take this thing beyond um, its its creeping stages to um, to make it a more um, acceptable uh, thing, and I think that as a result of that, as a result of that, 
a lot of people were torn off by the attitudes of some of those persons who were placed in those positions of, um, of leadership. Um, I, I, I would say that there were instances where people didn't serve the purpose that was intended. I would, in discussing the question of the failure of, the, of cooperativism, um, look at a number of factors. One could well mm -hmm. argue that the Ujama experience in Tanzania, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. was also an attempt at cooperativism, mm -hmm. and that in fact, in some regards, Burnham may also have been looking mm -hmm. at that as an example, because if I'm not mistaken, they too had a multi-tier system of local democracy. And they started their unit was really small unit of 10 houses. Mm -hmm. It was the smallest unit. And then they built until they got up to the regional level. And we saw that they too had problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems that Tanzania had was that there were leaders mm -hmm. who were so gone home on showing the Riri that they could build cooperatives, Ujama villages in this instance, that they did not go about it in a very systematic and scientific way. They imposed on the people uh, right. mm -hmm. the instances where they should have been learning from the people in mm -hmm. some regards, mm -hmm. educating the people, and taking a gradualist approach. So they imposed on the people, and when they imposed on the people, the conditions were not right for what they sought to impose. And so some of that may have occurred in the case of Guyana as well. Secondly, you have a situation, cooperatives really is supposed to represent a, a kind of a equality where irrespective of what your financial means are, you are one-on-one -on -one in the shareholding arrangement mm -hmm. because it's one vote that you exercise. And to a large extent, the idea was that really uh, the people who owned the cooperative would work in the cooperative and from among themselves would have a managerial group uh, to run the cooperative. I think one of the problems we ended up with was instances where people started to treat the cooperative as if it was a private enterprise uh, shareholding arrangement. So they weren't necessarily working, but they were shareholders and they became managers, but were not in the activity of, of, of production that the cooperative was intended to be engaged in. And therefore, you had conflict and difference of interest in terms of the people's involvement, and it didn't serve the entire community of cooperators when that happened. And therefore, you had some elements of distrust and some elements of confidence uh, falling away, and therefore the movement. Um, uh, one of the problems that the third world has had in its experiments is that uh, lagging behind in terms of development, in the, the haste to catch up, they didn't go through the gradual learning curve. It was an attempt to almost arrive um, immediately. Now, in the case of Guyana, you can't ignore the fact that the cooperative movement was akin to some kind of social development. And therefore, um, the macroeconomic situation eventually also impacted on everything in the country, including the cooperatives. So the problems that we had in terms of uh, the response to our socialist thrust, the denial, for example, the, the idea of hydropower and the possibility of hydropower being funded by the World Bank. And what happened in the 70s of that project obviously impacted on the local situation. Much of our foreign reserves was spent in preparation for the hydropower. Now, if that had worked, this country would have gone way ahead. It didn't work. The World Bank did not come on, on board. There were the issues with Venezuela and other countries. And so we didn't get the finance, but we had spent a lot of our reserves mm -hmm. building the infrastructure, and uh, forgive me if I sidetrack a bit, we mm -hmm. seem to repeat the same mistakes mm -hmm. over and over. Mm -hmm. Almost exactly from an economic and investment perspective, mm -hmm. 
what happened with the Maiju, the, the Mazuruni Haiju, has happened with the one. I mean, the, one, I mean the, the government has gone ahead. They've expended millions and billions of dollars in the road, not assured that they'll get the money for the Haiju. We've done the same thing. Rather than learning from our past experiences, we just castigate, which in, if we had learned, we'd have been able to overcome the problems and the see things differently. So there were issues that were local issues. There were issues that were global issues that impacted on the country. And inevitably, if they impacted on the country, they would impact on cooperatives. Because cooperatives had to be fostered. They had to be given the assistance to grow and to develop. And that's a financial issue. How do you get seed money uh, to, to facilitate their growth and develop it? If your, econ if your economy is in trouble, then those things become uh, difficult things to do. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the political support for, co for cooperativism. Um, and you mentioned particularly that the government in opposition at the time didn't necessarily support this broad vision of cooperativism. That government was in opposition became a government uh, that was not in opposition um, after 1992. And in fact, that's the government we have today. How do you see the attitude towards cooperativism? They have never really embraced cooperativism. Um, in those days, they, they, they saw cooperativism as revisionistic, you know, not, not progressive, not, not what was required for socialist construction. And so, in, 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 in a large measure, they came into government and have not really done much to foster the cooperative movement. Um, they've allowed it to fall apart. And now that it has fallen apart, they are the ones who now want to, to do the burial. So rather than saying that this is something that is good, that can help in the development of the country, and therefore dedicating some effort to its revitalization and resuscitation, they said, well, you're not working, and so we, we, we close you down. Ask yourself, how many cooperative offices we have? Mm -hmm. no, no. Over the years, how many cooperative offices have been going out there and working no. with these cooperatives? No. That has not been happening. So that they have definitely not fostered the development of cooperatives. And now that these cooperatives have floundered, they're there with the debt certificates uh, to deliver. But it's interesting to note, though, that even as I say that, that some of the cooperatives which have survived and have proven the worth of cooperatives are in the fishing industry and are largely cooperatives uh, that are populated by indo guyanese And I say that to show that, in fact, uh, the cooperative movement was not one that was restricted to a particular mm -hmm. ethnic group. Though, in some regards, the opposition of the day sought to project it uh, that way. The, the cooperative, the, the fishermen cooperatives, right. which were given infrastructure in most of the regions, be it in Morawana, be it in Mabaruma, be it on the quarantine, be it a charity, wharfs were built, facilities were built for the purpose of facilitating uh, the fishing industry. And not all of the cooperatives followed the exact same model. Some of them simply meant that here is a facility that the state built, the state handed it over to a body of people who then used that facility collectively to be involved in their individual endeavor. So the fishermen didn't have to give up the individuality to the co-op movement. What they did was to feed off of the cooperative aspect of the operation, the storage, the purchase, and things like that. But when it came to the sales of their fish, they were in the room, mm -hmm. and, 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 and mm -hmm. they did that. So the cooperative movement also was adapted to the various industries uh, in the country in a way in which people could feel comfortable with what they were getting involved in. And we can still today go to see the various uh, Fishing, uh, fishermen cooperatives as a good example of the success of the cooperative movement. Mm -hmm. Norman, I don't believe that we could overstress the point that uh, Vincent mm -hmm. made just now about the um, lack of support 
by this PPP government in relation to development of cooperatives in the society. In fact, I was making the same point that on our groundings program, which we had last week, because we were too were concerned about the fact that the government was moving to deregister over 200 societies. Mm -hmm. And um, we felt that um, it was a mistake. We felt it was a mistake on their part to move in that direction without giving the requisite assistance to the development of, the, of those societies, exactly. the, the redevelopment of those societies. I can remember Marie and I were um, years ago appointed to um, this national um, co national corp union union national yes. union, and we had come up as a collective with some concrete ideas on how it is to regenerate and revitalize some of the um, some some corp societies. And we presented that, um, those programs to the PPP government, the, the minister at the time. Um, I can't even remember who was the minister at the time. I, yeah, I can't remember who was the minister at the time. But we presented a comprehensive plan for development. And um, I can tell you this, that the position of the minister then is the same position that we face with today, that there was no interest in helping to revitalize the COP movement and what you found has happened between then and now is the continued deterioration of a lot of those societies. Vincent talked about the absence yeah. of um, corporate officers. And if it is that you don't have corporate officers monitoring these societies, what is going to happen to the societies if it is that they're not functioning properly? Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the corporate officers really is to help, um, you know, um, to stabilize, yes. help to stabilize those um, those societies so that we have a situation here where um, I, I'm in complete agreement with what Vincent said that this present government even when it was in opposition and now had no interest in relation to um, keeping the corp um, societies alive and uh, what we've seen here is a result of that uh, can you expand on oh. some of the ideas that you presented at that time for resuscitating the corps well, Do you we, remember any? Yeah, yeah, we were concerned, we were concerned as, um, as we are now, as the continuity mm -hmm. here at this particular juncture, that a lot of the societies weren't functioning the way in which they should be functioning. We were concerned about that. And we came up, uh, one of the things that we did was to, um, was to come up with a concrete plan on how it is that we can get those societies moving. It required, it required in, in, in some parts, employment of um, persons as co-op officers. Mm -hmm. But we felt that a lot of the groundwork could be done by us if it is that we were given the resources to do the work. We were never, we, we, we were never given the resources. We were never given the resources. And we w the, the plea to appoint co-op officers just fell on deaf ears. Yes. That didn't happen. And in fact, what you find is being happening is that there's a complete, there's a continued, um, um, Eradication of corp officers in the corp um, in the corp in the corp um, department, mm -hmm. and so that they're vo they're virtually running on on, 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 on nothing. Mm -hmm. They're virtually running on nothing. Do I you want to add, Yeah. Um, what Mr. Trantman is saying and Mr. Alexander is a fact, because this government now they have got the license now. They are the legal person now. What they are doing now is to close the entire corp because they just appoint somebody there they did no investigation they did nothing but they just move to 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 cancel all these societies and and they, they the co-op office is using certain sections of the 8801 which she did not apply which says that the commissioner shall carry out an inquiry based on the request of three quarters of the members of the society. That is one of the conditions for cancelling a society. You have to hold an uh, uh, inquiry. The other part is if the society falls below seven persons as members. None of these things were met. But they just feel that it's time now, to, as Mr. Alexander said, and I agreed with him, to carry the final lash to the co-op sector and to just close it off. Look, let me tell you, some of the, the, the credit unions on the list, Baramo, they have already been liquidated. 
but it shows that there was no no work being carried out to find out what is happening but it's just their intentions is one way is to get rid of these co-ops but you put them under this i want to uh um ask if it's not presumptuous to do so mm -hmm. what do you think outside of the general disinterest which you've elaborated on a lot mm -hmm. certainly co-ops would have assets yes um how would the law treat with the assets of the co-op if those co-ops um, were, were closed? They has to return back to the members. Individual members? Yes, it has to be divided with the members. And a lot of the societies that they have moved to cancel, those societies are active societies. I mean, what Mr. Trotman was saying is a fact. Where is the co-op officers? Those are the persons who help the co-op society. They come in ensure that the co-op society, the committee of management, etc., etc., is carrying out the, the purpose of cooperative. They will then feed that information back to the co-op ministry. We have boiled down to a department. There's an interesting point about this uh, winding up of these cooperatives. As we have said during the course of the program, there are different types of cooperatives. You have housing, you have Fishermen yes. cooperative, yeah, agriculture, yeah. Unions, et cetera, agriculture, mm. et cetera. Mm. In the instance of the agricultural cooperatives, in the instance of the housing cooperatives, the land may not have been transported or titled. Mm. You have instances where the land is lease land, instances where the land is state land at the disposal of the cooperative. Okay. So what this winding up is doing in some instances is to provide for the repossession of land exactly. by the state. Yes. And, I, and I think that that point should not be ignored. Yes, that's there a fact. Is a, there is very likely a, a program of land grabbing that will take place. And I think that the government has a extremely bad record mm -hmm on its um, attitude towards issues of land and its integrity and rectitude on issues of land. Mm -hmm. And I would want to use, I'm a Georgetown boy, so I don't have to use a rural example. The railway embankment between the St. John Road and High Street was repossessed under the pretext that they were going to run high voltage wires and that it was dangerous for people to live in the area where they were to run high voltage wires. The first thing they did, they repossessed the firm owned by Thomas at High Street. And Lamar, they, High Street. Lamar High Street, destroying the man's property that the man had developed and they installed the GPL there under the high voltage wires. And we've seen now that they've come all along that embankment to put in place parking lots, parking lots to facilitate enterprises that have sprung up on Lamar Street. Now, I'm not criticizing parking lots. I'm not criticizing the entities that have sprung up along High Street, but I'm saying, how could you thrust a government when they have demonstrated that they, do, they, 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 they are not honest in telling you the motive for what, what they're they doing. doing. Exactly. Because obviously the motive mm -hmm. could not have been to remove people from danger mm -hmm. on that reserve because they have now constructed parking lots and people are going to be in the same zone mm -hmm. of danger. They must have known what they're doing. And therefore, I come to this question with suspicion Mm -hmm. as to what will happen with the lands that they want to be possessed. But you see, um, what is happening is that, like, for example, my co-op society, we bought that land from the government in 1991. We have developed it, put in the various infrastructures, and we have a block transport for that land. We had a lot of problems to get it, but we subsequently got it. 
So we have been passing titles to our member. And what's the name of your corp? Eastville Housing Corp Society. Mm -hmm. But coming to the bottom, we have a few transport to be passed. And the commissioner, the CCDO, said to the court that they must not pass the transport to our members anymore. For what reason, I don't know. And this was before the announcement. And this was before the announcement. Even unknown to the society. They never even wrote us a letter saying, look, we will be stopping transports from passing or coming, let us talk and let us find out what is happening. Nothing of the sort. So considering what Ms. Alexander has said, mm -hmm. let's say in your case where uh, your co-op bought the land yeah, and you've been passing transport and now there's been this move to stop the final issuing of the final set of transports to some of your members. Mm. If this closure goes ahead, what happens to those people on well, that land? Well, you see, the, the situation that we are in is that the members of the society can take the society to court for failing to pass transport to them. The because society now becomes liable? Yes, that is our duty to do it, to pass mm. the transport to the members. Now, upon that, now we will have to take other measures because we have a we have a, that is a bony fire piece of land that belongs to the Corp Society. Let, just let me stick a pin yeah. here. It is true in normal circumstances yes. <laughs> that your members can take you to court. Yeah. But if the parcel of transport is frustrated exactly. and it's beyond your control, exactly. the members lose that opportunity of taking you to court because mm -hmm. you can you can you can argue frustration. Yes. Right? May I also add in all of these cooperative societies, there are pieces of land that are communal mm -hmm. that were not intended to be given to individual members for the construction of homes. Mm -hmm. They were intended to be left for yes. communal use, like is the case in Lamaha Springs Sp Garden. Gardens. Lamaha yeah. Gardens. Yeah. Those are the first pieces of land that will be moved on. Mm -hmm because they do not fall under the control of the individual. And if you, if you take the Co-op Society off the books, then in fact the owner of the land no longer exists. And the state, I rather suspect, will seek to repossess those pieces of land. So in instances where lands have not been allocated, and in instances where lands have been put aside for communal use, use they are now the prime target. Mm. Mr. Trotman. Uh, what <laughs> could be done? What do you see as, as uh, considering all that's been said mm -hmm. so far, how do you see? The well, the well one of my concerns has been that in the past, um, societies were not challenging the chief co-op officer when they moved to, the to um, strike them off the register. They were not, stri they were not um, challenging them for reasons I believe that um, said that the chief the CCDO's position um, is final. Ruling is final. That's in the con that's in the law you you're saying in the legislation. No, I'm saying I'm saying that that was that the was perception. the perception. Perception. No, and here it is. Um, we're fortunate to have Vincent again on this mm. the program because um, he's also he's uh, he's also very okay with the, with with the, with the laws mm -hmm. that the rules. I believe. And here it is, I'm giving my own personal opinion. I do believe that based on what is happening, the fact that the process, a process, has not been engaged in relation to, to um, striking off the societies, that societies will be within their rights to challenge in the courts some of those um, decisions. I believe so. Um, and I think that societies which have been struck off, particularly if it is that the process, because there has to be a process um, to be engaged in relation to moving to strike off. And if the process has not been engaged, I believe that societies must move to the court in order to establish challenges against the CCD. Is that a legitimate way forward, Mr. Alexander? That's a legal question. It's a mm -hmm. technical question. It could be different perspectives on the question. Um, if I were representing the government, for example, on a matter like that, my focus would be to see that these cooperatives have fallen into the 
default and therefore I do not have the standing anymore to approach the court. <laughs> I could use that argument. The question really is here. What's the disposition of the state to want the to assist? Do they want to assist or do they not want to assist? But I don't think that in the circumstance that one should speculate and that any cooperative should do whatever is possible to make a determination. And in that regard, I will support the position uh, taken by, by um, Desmond. Um, you see, what Mr. Alexander said is that the co-op sector is being governed by a law, 8801. And in that law, it's specified. And any legal action that is taken, and I think any fair legal structure could make a fair decision once those procedures has not been carried out. And my position is that I agreed with Mr. Trotman that it is time now that the co-ops sector stand up and be counted because advantage is being taken of us. We are in a situation where people is given power and they prey upon people who does not have the power to fight back with them. That is what is happening. I'm going to ask you a speculative question now. But, but before, you, before you go there, I want yeah. to add something. Yeah. I want to add something to this um, scenario. You know, the CCDO is the person who's supposed to be taking these actions. And CCDO is? The chief corporate co officer. officer. A few years ago, we had a minister who decided on her own to strike off, to deregister a number of um, land societies, I think, on the West Yeah. Um, on her own. And it is only as a result of the action taken by the societies that they were reinstated. So I'm saying that, I'm, and, 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 and I think, because they were land societies, I think that they were struck off for the reasons that uh, Vincent had, I, had identified. And so that we have to be very, very concerned about some of these, uh, some of these uh, actions. Particularly, I believe, because I don't think that the law gives them the right to strike off societies without first determining that those societies have fallen into, um, into disrepair. They have to be absolutely certain about that. Now, who will advise you about that? Who will advise you about that? One will believe that the monetary officer, the corp officer, uh, will be in a position to say um, that is happening. But if there's no mm -hmm. corp officer, exactly. how then could you arrive at that conclusion yes. and move the strike off? But you mentioned an important, but the, the Rosadanti Corp, which I think was one of those corps that you're referring to, they lost that case, didn't they? Is that fact correct? Yeah, the land has been taken away from them. So, so they mounted a legal challenge and lost. You know, but I, I, it, it might not have been it might not have been Rosenanti that I was talking about, but the minister involved was Minister Bibi Shadi, and there was a hue and cry, and it's out of that hue and cry that she reversed her decision. Mm. So this is a plan in motion for a while. Uh, yeah, we got to be very concerned about that. No. And we're about closing time. We've been talking here about the co-ops, but just so the audience here gets an idea of what we're talking about in terms of assets, and of course I'm asking you to speculate here. Mm -hmm. What we do speculate is the value of assets held by cooperatives in this country. <laughs> it's, it's of course speculative, I yeah. know that. But if you were to venture, so people know they're uh, looking at when we're talking about winding up these organizations, 200 of them, that we're really talking about repossessing assets or redistributing assets to a value of this ballpark figure. Uh, I go well, like because um, when you talk about co-op, you also talk about credit unions. Mm -hmm. They also will have to come on. We have very large credit unions in this country. Very G large, meaning billions, millions, billions, and billions. Of GDF, police, mm -hmm. public service, public service, mm -hmm. plenty. Billions, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And even some of the school thrift societies still have money lying in those banks that was not being able to access. Mm -hmm. Because the thrift society started 
when you were in school as a little child you go to school you used to be proud to line up in the line and bank at 25 cents or 5 cents every bank in the mm -hmm. you have the housing sector they have billions of dollars right it's, it's, it's I <laughs> because even we look at the credit unions and the, the government is also trying to put us put into the credit unions as well but I don't know how that will end up being but I trust God that things can you know, change around. In closing, Mr. Alexander, no, what? I, I, all right, I would say that mm -hmm. the, the assets involved here, we talking about billion dollars, billion dollars yes. assets are involved, particularly in relation to the land at the going price now, mm -hmm. which the state is disposing mm -hmm. of land. But I would like to say that what shocked me as a citizen it's when I noticed the police corp society was listed. Mm -hmm. Because I passed through Up Street and I see that society as an active society. And I'm saying if that society is active, that what one should really be doing is seeking to assist it to get itself in order, in order. rather than listening for deregistration when it is on a daily basis providing a service to its members and a service to the public. I can't talk for all the co-op societies, no. but I see that one, and that one caused me to, to, to ponder what is the motive. Here is uh, the police force, a state organization with a cooperative that is evidently operating. I don't have the books up to order, but they're operating, they're buying, they're selling, mm -hmm. and they're providing a service. And I don't see the emphasis being an effort to bring them up to speed, rather the emphasis is an effort to close them down. In closing, I think we are <laughs> winding up time. I think we, we haven't underlined in the course of our discourse the fact that the cooperative movement is intended to give the small man, the ordinary man, an opportunity to be involved in something that allows him to be productive, that allows him to be empowered, that allows him to be self-employed in circumstances where there are issues of unemployment and there are issues of disempowerment. And so one would think that one of the strategies that will be used is to use the cooperative movement parallel to iPad, small enterprise, and things like that, to give the small man an opportunity to be involved in beneficial activity. The crop could simply mean that two small, seven small men with their individual rice plots buy a tractor to share it across those rice plots, rather than them trying to buy seven tractors, seven tractors. that they can't mm -hmm. afford. It is something that has to do with economies of scale mm -hmm. for the involvement of ordinary people mm -hmm. in business. That's true. Well, Maria, yeah. you want in, in your closing remarks? Well, I hope that um, we can have a review of this situation. And like Mr. Alexander said, that lots of these co-ops that is on the list are active. I can speak for my co-op. I don't want to say anything for anybody else, but I can speak for my co-op. We are an active co-op society. We keep meetings, we do our work, we maintain our community, and we have investment going because we, we have rented a piece of our land to, to Digicel and they pay us a, a monthly rental for our piece of land. So the co-op society is active and we're working. But it's just that there is a thing out there to just de-regularize these societies. And I hope that they can sit down and reconsider them. No, I want to take um, the, point, the last point that, that Vincent made a little further. Um, in, f in fact, I'm supporting the point that he made. And I just wanted to add something to it. Historically, um, Co-op societies in this country have been the organizations of the poor. Because um, basically, 
it, it represents the coming together of persons who are in dire straits and who want to improve their lot. And so that they pool their resources and try to and try to go forward. You can't argue that you're assisting the most vulnerable in the society and move to destroy the organizations of the poor. And I believe, and I believe that if it is that this government is really serious about um, assisting the most vulnerable in the society, the most vulnerable in the society, they must relook their whole position in relation to those societies which they are moving to the register. Some, for the reasons that uh, Vincent and Maria um, spoke about, because most, some of them are active, and for the fact that if it is that you know that some of them are inactive as a result of even so their own feelings that you owe it to them in order to work towards regenerating re um, their, 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 their um, existence. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's been a very, uh, very educational program, at least for me it has been, and I hope it has been for you. Um, this has been the African Drums, a presentation of the Coffee 250 Committee. This evening we talked about cooperativism in Guyana. We looked not only at the cooperative movement itself, but the vision and concept of cooperativism. More particularly, we focused on the recent moves by the CCDO to close, deregister a number of, of, of uh, cooperatives, a number of them still active. I hope that this program reaches you in your homes, and if you're affected by the issues that we discussed this evening, please reach out to the Coffee 250 Committee. The Coffee 250 Committee is educated to uh, raising awareness on the experience of African people in Guyana. We can be reached um, by email, coffee250gy at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Check us out on YouTube, the YouTube channel, Coffee 250, or on Facebook with the same name, Coffee 250. This has been African Drums. I've been your host, Norwell Hines. Join us again next weekend. Bye-bye.